Welcome to Life Talks with Stephen and Pat. All right, we're digging down deep into Proverbs 13. Yay! And this is going to be an awesome session. It is. Pam, this morning we were just praying for so many faithful people who support this ministry. Oh, thank the Lord for them. Yeah. We know a lot of these people personally and their faces come to my mind even in the night. and They sure do. We continue to pray blessings on the seed that they've sown because, you know, as we talked about, your seed cannot improve the ground, but it proves the ground. I love that. I believe that God has ordained this ministry to set people free because the Word of God never returns empty or void. Amen. The privilege that we get to be message carriers to the world to that one individual in those thousand communities. Yes. That's why these life talks are so important. But that's why you, my friend, are so important. You are. We just speak blessings over you. We speak blessings over the seed that you sow, the love that comes out of you, the words of encouragement that you speak. The obedience that you walk in to be a message carrier yourself. And even when you're sitting in a coffee shop, like I said, and sharing your earbuds with a friend over a coffee and just listening to a proverb. That's a great idea. You're having church right there in that cafe. You are. And yeah. the Bible says, if any two will agree is touching any one thing, that's Matthew 18, 19. Jesus said, you end up obligating, so to speak, the very hand of God in your life. So there's nothing like coming into agreement over the very eternal word. Word of God that never fails, never returns void. And it's very mysterious, you know. It truly is a spiritual, supernatural thing. It's hard to comprehend sometimes, but when we partner together, then every person born again, every pastor, college student, teenager, family, anything that's been put together and back with the Holy Spirit's direction and healing, every person that comes to know Jesus, you're a part of. You're a part of, so when you get to heaven, it's like, even though you never meet these people across the world that we get to minister to, they'll know when they get to heaven. Oh, you partnered with, oh, my life was forever changed. I was healed. My family was put back together. I was born again. And they will know in the spirit realm. I know that sounds funny, but it's actually true. It's a very mysterious thing. You might be sitting there saying, well, you know, I haven't supported your ministry financially yet. (laughs) Just the seed of your attention, the seed of even coming into partnership with us and helping to encourage others to get into listening to the Word and downloading God's message for their life, having a coffee with a friend and indulging in the Word of God together, that is a seed. You're becoming a partner with us and bringing the message to so many people that that's what they need. They need hope. They need encouragement. They need a friend to sit down and just initiate where we break the Word of God together. We break the bread of God's Word and indulge in it. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for being a partner with us and just enjoying the Word of God together. Pam and I are not assigned to everybody, but we are assigned to you and you're assigned to us. Yes, And that's how God knits us all together. Mm -hmm. He puts us together in the right order. And that's the beautiful thing. It's Him building the church. Not us. He's the one that builds the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. We're called to do what he tells us to do. And so Pam and I are aware of that. And that's where discretion kicks in. Yeah, that's so true. There's a stirring in your heart. You know, it says in the word, those that water they themselves shall be watered. And when I think of being watered, I think of a dry summer day when I'm so thirsty and in the desert or something in Arizona or something where you're just so thirsty and you're watering. When you water, when you give, I really do believe that you are watered. It's kind of amazing. And I I know we want to go on here, but these thousand communities and spheres of influence that God has called us to, we have so many businessmen and businesswomen, even head of corporations, following your teaching now is a part of the pattern as God gave it to you. And that's a sphere of influence, a different sphere of influences in communities across the world. But it is so neat, without even us even sharing this, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm going to raise up a thousand people to sponsor one of those thousand spheres of influence in communities. And without any pushing, without any begging, without any even putting it out there, it's amazing how many people are sending a gift and saying, I want to adopt one of those. So sending a thousand dollar gift, I want to adopt one of those um, communities. Those communities. So thank you so much. The Holy Spirit's so good. He puts it in our heart who we're supposed to partner with. Talking about the Holy Spirit, let's ask him for his help right today on this chapter. Proverbs 13. We're about to get into some exciting things. We're going to 
be talking about some process here. We're going to be talking about, once again, the wisdom of God and how to apply it to our lives and our thinking, how to apply it to our mouths. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. What a privilege it is to have you teach us, counsel us, instruct us, even clear the ground of our hearts so that we can truly receive the unfolding of this mystery map that gives us direction and makes us prosperous in every area of our lives. Every area of our lives is affected. Thank you, Lord. Dear Lord, by this word. So Holy Spirit, breathe it right now. Put your breath upon the word of our Father and cause it to find its mark in our heart and our minds and convert our thinking in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 13, starting at verse 1. A wise son, a wise daughter, heeds and is the fruit of his father's instruction and correction, but a scoffer listens not to rebuke. Well, I feel like we've been here already several times talking about this. What distinguishes a wise person from an unwise person is their ability to not just hear. Jesus would preface his sermons a lot of times with this. He would say, to them who have ears to hear, let them be hearing and listening. To those who have eyes to see, let them be seeing and perceiving. What Jesus was really saying was, it's not enough to hear the words, the audio vibrations, But you have to move those words, the hearing, into obeying. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, we show up on a Sunday morning, let's say, to hear a message, or we go to a Bible study, hear a message, but we're really not biblically hearing until we're acting on it in obedience. A scoffer listens not to a rebuke. It doesn't mean that the scoffer has got his ears plugged. Every time a rebuke or a reproof comes up that would make his life better or make her life better, They just refuse to hear it. Yeah, it's true. They won't act on it. They won't obey. This is how you discover that someone loves wisdom. They're able to hear a reproof, receive instruction, process it, and move it into a responsive action item. Simply put, course correction. Oh, I think we all have new motivation to be wise and listen to instruction. Two, a good man and woman eats good from the fruit of his mouth, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. So again, we got a good man eating good from the fruit of his mouth. And I want to just remind us again what Jesus said. He said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart flings forth good things. Right. So Healing, you, joy, blessing. It really is telling us that our words are seeds. Yeah. A good man, a good woman, she eats good from her mouth, the fruit of her mouth, because she speaks hope-filled words, faith-filled words, truth-filled right. words. She ends up walking into harvest of that outcome, right? Right. That That's so good. Verse three, he who guards his mouth... Why, why would we want to guard our mouth? It says, he who guards his mouth keeps his life, but he who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. I remember when I was a boy, Pam, my mom would hear me speaking negatively and she would say, Stephen, don't say that. Don't you understand the Bible says you're snared with the words of your mouth? And that so got into my heart, that was the beginning of me correcting my mouth. And believe me, it wasn't an overnight thing. I was, I could tend to be a little bit of a bottom feeder. (laughs) Real negative, like like on yourself. I remember when we were boys, just me and my brother, my brother had a habit of whistling and I had a habit of growling. My mom would say, Stephen's my little bear. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, I don't want to be the bear. (laughs) (laughs) I want to be the whistler. Well, you can be. (laughs) But it says, think about this. If you want to guard your life, if you feel like your life is vulnerable, It says, he who guards his mouth keeps his life. So good. I don't think naturally we understand how supernatural our words are. Yeah. Think about it. People think it's natural when somebody in a parking lot is cussing out their car because it doesn't work. You stupid piece of junk. And everybody's like, oh, you know, Bob over there is having a hard day. And it's like, to them, that's natural. But if they were to hear somebody out in the parking lot, car, you serve me. You are a blessing from on high for me. And you do me good. And you will not fail. And everybody would be like, that guy needs to be, somebody needs to take that guy away. (laughs) There's something wrong with him. He's. We we have somebody that's lost their mental capacity to function in the real world. That's so true. Isn't that something? That's so true. But it says, he who guards his mouth keeps his life, but he who opens wide his lips. We were talking earlier how that the word says in James, be 
quick to hear, but be slow to speak. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what it's talking about. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Don't talk from your feelings. Yeah. Speak what the word has assigned you to speak. I've heard many people say, and I'm probably said it in the past myself, but it's not in the Bible. Well, God knows my heart. I can speak what I want, and He just knows my heart. That's not really found in the Bible. That's a cliche that you've made up, but we make up to try to justify us being able to speak well, any think way about it. we, we say, want to. God knows but... what my heart is, but the Word says that our hearts are wicked and deceitful above all things. Right. We have to line up our words with His Word. Also, I think we have to realize some people we can say, well, this is just the way my family is. This is the way my nationality is. We just talk a lot. We just say what we feel and we're scorners and we're sarcastic. I saw a statement on somebody's t-shirt, a printed on a woman's t-shirt. I was going in the store the other day and it said, I am sarcastic and proud of it. And something like, if sarcastic is bad, I don't want to be right. And I thought... (laughs) How sad is that? They've taken the identity of being sarcastic, which is not the character of the Lord. The Lord is not sarcastic. And sometimes I think we can justify us the way we say things, the tone of the way we say things, justifying, well, this is the way my family has been. This is just the way I am. When we're sons and daughters of the Most High God, you submit yourself to the DNA, like you say, of Jesus Christ. His yeah. royal blood is flowing through our veins. That's why we should try to talk like Him, speak the words that He would speak speak, in the tone that he would speak. Right. That takes time to know that. So you have to submit yourself like we're doing, reading the Word of God together, having it unfolded to us, because when you speak words of life, there's power and life in them. That's good, Pam. You know, it's funny. I grew up, like what you were talking about, that cliche. I've heard many times people in different circumstances, good people saying, well, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out what to do, but I realize at the end of the day, I just have to trust my heart. They kind of pat their heart. I've had sessions in my office as a pastor with people coming in dealing with life crisis and saying, well, you know, Pastor Stephen, I just have to trust my heart. We have to come back to Jeremiah 17, verse 5 says, cursed is the man who trusts in man. That could be other people, but it also could be yourself. You know, you're human. Cursed is the person who trusts in people or trusts in yourself. You're a people. Yeah, it's good. Because ultimately it gets to Jeremiah 17, verse 9, and God says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. That's what I was saying. The human heart is deceitful above all things, and God calls it desperately wicked. And he says, who can know it? And God goes on and he says, I, the Lord, I search the heart and I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God knows the heart. And so people say, well, you know, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, at the end of the day, without him converting it, it's wicked. Well, I think we have to understand there's different terms mean different things in the word. There's a difference between following your spirit, man or woman having an unction and direction of the Holy Spirit. That's different than following your mind, will, and emotions that could be still subject to wrong thinking, abuse, the world's influence, the way you've been raised. There's two different things. Being subject, we bring our mind, will, and emotions, our heart, to bow at the foot of the cross, his way of thinking and doing things, which our spirit man or woman wants to submit to. But they're two different things. So you can't just say, well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. Yeah. He wants to get his will to affect our mind, will, and emotions and so our, let me and just our put body. A bow on this for what we were talking about. We were talking about the person who opens wide his lips and comes to ruin. Why does he come to ruin? He's speaking just from his human heart and his human mind. Mm-hmm. He's speaking reactively. He's speaking just from his human heart where we can speak from our heart where we've put in good things, the Word of God like we're doing right now. When we speak from our heart because it's filled with God's Word, then we're not speaking reactively. We're speaking reflectively based on the Word of God that we've digested. We're taking a moment. We're saying, wait a second, let me put a guard on my mouth here. What does God's Word say? What have I meditated on from God's Word? Now, that's what I'm going to speak in this situation. That's good. The circumstances say this, you're going to fail, but what's God's Word say? God's Word says, I'm a tree planted by the rivers of water. I bring forth my fruit in my season, whatever I do will prosper. And see, that goes against your flesh. 
I'm not feeling that. Yeah. I'm not feeling in this situation like I'm going to prosper. I feel like I'm going to fail. Right. But I'm not going to open wide my reactive lips. I'm going to speak from the Word of God. Verse 4. The appetite of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the appetite of the diligent is abundantly supplied. Again, so enjoy the word diligent. You see it over and over all through the Bible, the New and the Old Testament. Diligent. You do not see the word driven in a positive light, hardly ever, but you do see the word diligent. The appetite of the sluggard craves and gets nothing. Sometimes in life, we can use our appetite to our benefit. But when you say that word diligent, the appetite of the diligent is abundantly supplied. I think it's because, you know, we can just begin to move our diligence into step by step. Yeah, step the, by step. I don't know if it's a metaphor or an analogy talking about eating the elephant. How do you eat an elephant? You know, it's just one bite at a time. We have to approach big problems with, instead of just trying to solve the whole problem all at once, what is the order, the approach? God gives us a step-by-step approach. How do you get a million dollars penny by penny? Right. You have to have respect for the penny. Yeah. For Pick the up small the amount. Every dollar. You yeah. celebrate it. You respect it. You know, you never love it. We don't love money. You practice stewardship, knowing that God honors good stewards. So you practice making your appetite and desires work for you yeah. to motivate your diligence, right? And so that's right. what I think that's encouraging us today. Verse five, a consistently righteous man or woman hates lying and deceit. So again, let's take back the term hate. Don't teach your children that hate is a bad word. Teach them how to balance the duality of being a righteous person, which loves righteousness, but hates unrighteousness. You love health, divine health, but you hate sickness. Right, right. You don't want anybody being sick. No. You know, that's why when we pray for our enemies, Jesus said to love your enemies. What you do is you pray for them not to be sick. You come against the disease that would even go after your enemies. It's like saying, you know, someone's got a really, really bad flu and your child has a temperature of 105 or 104. And someone goes, oh, a mother goes, I hate that flu bug. Right. You know, I hate that virus. And someone to go, oh, no, 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 don't say that. <laughs> you know, you, listen, my little girl's got 105 fever from a virus. I, I'm i going to say that I hate that virus. Right. You know, it's the virus that's trying to destroy something precious. The person, we can't hate people, but we can hate the circumstances. Yeah. And right now, because in life, a lot of times we get a perverted way of thinking and we're just like, well, we just need to get rid of hate and just abolish the word. Well, then I find almost like the culture begins to hate one another. Yeah, Based on, well, you know, what political party are you affiliated with? Well, I just automatically hate you. I don't even know you, but I hate you. Right, right. You know, like, what color is your skin? Well, I don't even know you, but I hate you right, already. You right. know what? You speak with an Irish dialect. You know, you speak with kind of more this accent, Swedish accent. Well, I don't even know who you are, but I hate you. Right, right. Well, it's because we haven't properly learned to hate the right thing. We should hate sickness. Yes. It doesn't matter. You know, if that person has even poised themselves, set them up to be your enemy, we should still hate disease right. if it comes on that person. But what we're like, I'm selective now. You see, I hate disease if it comes on my friends. But if disease comes on that person over there who I tend to dislike, well, now I kind of like it. Oh, wait a sec. See, that's perverted. It is. That's and, twisted. And even in the word, and you can tell me where this is at, but it says, don't get really happy. Even when someone that's very, very predator and evil, they get their justice because they sown such evil and something happens to them. Don't rejoice on that. We're going to come up on that proverb. Yeah. Oh, we are? And it okay. really helps us understand, even with people who are enemies who have set out to be destructive toward you, the word says, you know, obviously God's your defense and your protector. Yeah. And so as they sow seeds like that toward you, things aren't going to go well with them. But we can't rejoice when they get that harvest coming on them. Why? Because again, we love righteousness. We pray for those. We bless those who curse us. And look as you continue to read on. Okay. So a consistently righteous man hates lying and deceit. A consistently righteous woman hates lying and deceit. But a wicked man is loathsome. His very breath spreads (laughs) pollution. I got stinky breath here. (laughs) written in my Bible. (laughs) And he comes surely to shame. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's very sad. Like, it's a sad thing to see any person come to shame. But that is the harvest on their, even their breath. Yeah. 
They got bad breath in a spiritual way, right? And I think it's important to know that when we think of the word wickedness, we think of just such severity. But as you once pointed out, wicked, if you look at it, it means just crooked. Uh, A tree branch comes from the root word wicker. Yeah. And so if you're off in anything and not walking in truth, you can get off. It's not that you're out there hurting people, but there's different levels of wickedness. And even being wicked a little bit, speaking untruth in your mouth, it can make you have very, very stinky breath. (laughs) Six, righteousness, rightness, and justice in every area and relationship guards him who is upright in the way, but wickedness plunges into sin and overthrows the sinner. We're kind of doing an A, B. You've got righteousness and you've got wickedness. Rightness is considered straightness precision in alignment with God's word and God's way of thinking. You got wickedness, which has got a crookedness to it. Right. There's no predictable outcome. It seems like it's pointed in this direction, but as it goes, it wickers, it twists, it turns. And God is anti-wickedness. And just like you read here, rightness actually guards you in your way. Yeah. We buy insurances for cars, for houses, for a person's life. The ultimate insurance in life is righteousness. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we have been made the righteousness of God in in Christ Christ Jesus. Jesus. Isn't that encouraging to know that? Very much. That's so good. Verse 7, one man considers himself rich, yet he's got nothing to keep permanently. Another man considers himself poor, yet has great and indestructible riches. So when it says here, another man considers himself poor, yet has great and indestructible riches, it's because he's humbled himself Jesus said this in Matthew, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. You're empowered to be prosperous are the poor in spirit. There's something about when I consider myself poor in myself, when Stephen in himself has nothing, is nothing. But in Christ, I'm rich. Yes. Right? In Christ, that's right. I'm made the righteousness of God. To me, that's alignment with truth. Even Jesus said, apart from the Father, I can do nothing. Well, how much more us... Right? We should have that mentality. That's right. So there's a blessedness, there's a wealth to being in alignment with the truth in your thinking. It says here in verse 7, one man considers himself rich. When you think that you're rich, I'm a self-made millionaire, or I've got this by myself. It's like, oh, wait (laughs) Be very cautious, yeah, man. You're, yeah. you're being deceived. You're in self-deception. I'm thinking of someone right now who's a very successful businessman, multimillionaire, and he is a believer in Jesus Christ. But if you ever even say to him things that are happening good in his company, if you ever even say to him, that's the blessing of the Lord. Oh, no, no, no. I did it all myself. And you know, he's got riches, but he's not a happy person. His family's not happy. It's the whole Frank Sinatra, yeah. I did it my <laughs> way. Thank you, Frankie. <laughs> Eight, a rich man can buy his way out of a threatened death by paying a ransom, but the poor man doesn't even have to listen to threats from the envious. This isn't saying let's all be poor, is it? No, it's just saying. Right, right. It's just saying, but, let me just tell you, this is what's going to Well, happen. this proverb is really defining. Remember, a rich man can buy his way out of threatened death by paying a ransom. Well, that's because he's the one that considers himself rich within himself. So he kind of flaunts it? Maybe, so, well, now his wealth becomes subject to ransom. But the person, Got the poor it. man, yeah. doesn't even have to listen to threats. So, From you know, the well, envious. <laughs> right. Like when you're poor in spirit, like Jesus was talking about Got in the it. book of Matthew, yeah. right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And that doesn't mean like, woe is me. I'm sacrificing. The poor in spirit, let's go back to the original definition of it and not let it be redefined But what the world says. Poor in spirit means a submissive, a humble heart. That's totally what it means. Remember, whenever you hear humble, whenever you hear poor in spirit, it's talking about humility and it's talking about alignment with the truth. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 3, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right. Well, we know from Matthew six thirty three that seek first the kingdom of God and all these things right. shall be added unto you. So when you inherit, when you have the kingdom of heaven, you have access to all this supply. God meets all of your needs according to Philippians 4, verse 19, right? Thank God. He meets all of our needs abundantly. Verse 9, the light of the uncompromisingly righteous is within him. 
it grows brighter and rejoices. But the lamp of the wicked furnishes only a derived temporary light and shall be put out shortly. Pam, I was reading the other day Isaiah 60, and it says, Arise, shine, for For your light light has come. come. You know, God wants to make us a light, not just even within our home, within our family, but the word says to the nations. Yeah. There's a great darkness coming on the world, and we see it. We see people wanting to expand even things like abortion and yeah. all this kind of craziness. Wow. But God's called us in the midst of the darkness to be a light, yes. a light for goodness, for righteousness, God's light shining through us to the world, and that we would be a hope even for kings and for nations. This is so encouraging. The light of the uncompromisingly righteous. Well, my light is really Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's not my light. I have no righteousness to speak of in myself, but the light of the uncompromisingly righteous is within him. And I think it's important as we walk to see ourselves like that. We don't have to get in fear. If you look around the world and you watch media and TV, it seems like the darkness is just overtaking, but that's not the truth. As long as sons and daughters are here operating in the kingdom of God on this earth. Yeah, remember God said when Abraham was talking with God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham kept negotiating with God saying, okay, well, how about 15 righteous people in Sodom? Will you destroy it then? Okay, no, I won't. I'll let it pass. Well, okay, well, let's, can we renegotiate again? What, how about for 10 righteous people? <laughs> then I think he even gets down to five. Right. God's like, you know, even for five, think of it. There is so much power in walking one person in your community, standing up and just with quiet confidence, walking in the rightness of God. And your light is going to continue to shine so bright, it literally will destroy and drive back the darkness. And that's why we talked about the beginning of this session, partnership with those of you who are listening with us. Our spiritual partnership is rich. It's vital. As you and I agree on the righteousness of Jesus, as we come to the Word of God and we make His truth and righteousness the priority, and we become spiritual partners, so to speak. Yes, we are. God knits us together. We're assigned to one another. We can stop tidal waves of darkness Yes. (laughs) by letting the light shine through us. And let me just read that again. The light of the uncompromisingly righteous, which for us is a guarantee it's Jesus. Yes. And his way of thinking and doing things. That's right, Pam. And it continues is within him. Well, we know that's true. Christ Almighty lives on the inside of us. It says it grows brighter and rejoices. Well, it's growing brighter because you and I are partnering and our level of agreement on the word is increasing second by second. Then it goes on, but the lamp of the wicked, it's a form of light, furnishes only a derived temporary light. In other words, it's a fake pretend light. It's like a Las Vegas light. It's all neon, but there's no substance to it. Shall be put out shortly. And I'm not, if you live in Las Vegas, I'm not trying to speak anything bad about (laughs) your city. In the name of Jesus, we take your city for Jesus. I'm talking about spiritual light here that has the power to save, set free, and illuminate eternity. Oh, thank God for his light especially in these crazy times. Verse 10. By pride and insolence comes only contention, but with the well-advised is skillful and godly wisdom. Oh, that's really good. I like that. With the well-advised is skillful and godly wisdom. Let's say you're going to get married. That's quite a contract right there. Ask yourself, are you well-advised? I've done a lot of premarital counseling for some wonderful couples and for couples who are married but hitting some difficult waters. You have to ask yourself, am I well advised right now? Because if you get good advice and if you get good counsel and you actually apply it, then it says you get skillful and godly wisdom. Yeah, that's right. It's like anything. If you drive skillfully, it's better for your car and it's better for your life. If you drive unskillfully, right. even coming to a four-way stop, you're going to get a fender bender. It's going to cost a lot of money. So there's advantages to living life skillfully. Yeah. Are you driving down the road of life with skill? That's really good. And you know, that I, takes time. That takes paying attention. That takes seeking out wisdom and it understanding. It takes instructors. Do you have right. instructors in your life? Do you have somebody teaching you? Somebody might say, my goodness, if only I had more money. Wait a sec. Do you have skill with the money that you do have? Because if you don't know how to handle $10, there's no way you're going to know how to handle $10,000. That was a big thing for me, Pam, because, you know, I grew up in poverty. And the truth is, I had no skills with money. Right. And I kept thinking the answer was more money. 
But the more money I got, then I ended up going in debt more. So a lot of times we think in life, if only we had more things coming to us. Oh, if only I had more opportunities. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have skill with the opportunities that you do have? Yeah, right. Because if you're not skillful with the opportunities you do have, getting more opportunity is actually only going to amplify the sin in your life of poor stewardship. And poor stewards, there's great consequences to not being a good steward of whatever it is, money, time, opportunity, relationships. If you're not a good steward of the relationships you do have, Adding more relationships is only going to amplify the sin and the repercussions of poor stewardship. That right there, I see so much. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in so many people's lives. If I add one more thing, if I do one more thing, and it can be even good things, if I volunteer for one more thing, but you're not even stewarding what you're doing right now. You know, I've been on hot air balloon rides where we go more than a thousand feet in the air. It's so pretty. But to get everything like prepared, the balloon is anchored to the ground and then they get the burners working to heat the air inside the balloon. So it has like a lifting power. Everybody knows they use sandbags to keep everything anchored and and stable throughout the whole process of getting the hot air in the balloon. And then you get in and then somebody takes off the bags, the sandbags, releases them, cuts them free. And with every bag, it goes up a little bit more and a little bit more until then it flies. And so sometimes I feel like we want to add more things in our life and we wonder why we're not flying, we're not raising up above circumstances in life and even making a difference. It's because we're not willing to say, hey, I'm going to say no to that so I can really steward this one thing really well. And when I steward that well, then I can go on to the next thing. But adding more bags in your life is not going to help you steward what you're originally designed to manage or watch over. That's really good, Pam. Yeah, I like that. And just folding back on the beginning of that verse where it says, by pride and insolence comes only contention. Here's a little trick that the Holy Spirit has taught me through the years of just downloading scripture and especially working in the book of Proverbs. It's like he wants me to look at the outcome. Just go to the word contention. To have contention in your life, to have problems, striving, struggling, stress, to be dealing with the darkness, the adversity, all that contention, that's the outcome. So how did we get there? And it goes, by pride and insolence comes only contention. That word insolence basically means contemptuous talk, overbearing, insulting talk. So by pride and overbearing, insulting speech, you know, it kind of throws me back to what we were talking about in verse three, where it says, the person who opens wide his lips comes to ruin, ruin, contention, All of that stuff, it says, by pride and insolence comes only contention. And let me interject here. I see this in the world happening. People using words and saying, I'm kind, I'm merciful, you're not. I'm this, I'm that, you're not. And most of the time, the people that are saying that, they're the unkind ones. They're the arrogant and they're the selfish and work almost 24 hours a day to tell other people how awful they are. We tend to see things the way we are. If we're filled with pride and contention, we tend to have that worldview. This is where confirmation bias kicks in. We then begin to intentionally look for any worldview that supports or confirms our bias. We run from correction and instead pursue affirmation. It's the deceptive pathway of pride. People who are joy-filled, who are glad, and who have a humble heart, I admire those people because I look at them and they tend to have this worldview that's joy-filled. It's not like they got their head in the sand. It's not like they're thinking that there's no trouble, but they're seeing always the good. They're joy-filled, they're glad, and they're of a humble heart, and they tend to recognize humility in people when I'm like, I guess I didn't see that. And they see the advantages. They don't always see the bad in what somebody does, but they see, oh, but look what they did here, and they stood up for righteousness here, and they did this here, and they were kind here. It's like Sam Walton one time stopped at one of this little podunk retail shop in this town on their way to a big Walmart. And anyway, Sam Walton and one of his top executives stopped, and he said, hey, let's just take a run through this 
retail store and just see what we see. And so when this executive came back, he's telling the story and he said, I was like, oh my goodness, this is awful and this is awful and this. But he said, Sam Walton was like, man, did you see this section? How they had it on display? That was so good. You know, it just goes to show you because he's diligent. Yes. And he wants to know more and be corrected so he can be successful. He had a humble heart as far as that goes to say, you know, I want to learn from other people. I want to continue to keep learning. He saw the good and the opportunity, even where Mm -hmm. this other guy couldn't see good and couldn't see opportunity. You've got to be able to perceive it. And that takes humility. I appreciate that. That's really good, Pam. Verse 11, wealth not earned, but won in haste or unjustly or from production of things for vain or detrimental use, such riches will dwindle away. But he who gathers little by little, what are we talking about here? Process. We're talking about stewardship, diligence. He who gathers little by little will increase his riches. And I mean, that just thematically just so fits in what we're talking about. You can get wealth, you can get all kinds of money, but if you've done it in haste or unjustly, all you're going to do is amplify the emptiness on the inside of you. And you're going to end up experiencing more of that. It was a woman in Detroit who won a million dollars and she was already struggling with drug addiction. She was a single mom, little girl, I think it was. And she won, I think, a million or two million dollars. Within a year, she was dead because all it did was amplify her drug addiction and her lifestyle. It just amplified it to the point where she ended up killing herself unintentionally. And I think that that's what we are doing, learning God's wisdom, his understanding little by little. We're getting bigger inside to be able to handle more and more blessings with joy. We go back to the scripture in Proverbs that says, the blessing of the Lord makes truly rich. Truly rich. It's not a fake richness. It's a real blessing to every fiber of your being and your family's life, your friend's life. The blessing of God, here's the characteristics when you know it's from God. It makes truly rich. He adds no sorrow with it. Neither does toiling increase it. And I think when we take that one step at a time, little by little, we learn to manage this, steward that well. Then we go on to the next step. We learn to steward that better. And I think it's a process where you learn how to manage what God's given you and it be a blessing in your life and not a curse in your life. You know, Pam, that's so good. There's some people thinking right now, if only I could become a doctor, if only I could get the education and become a great lawyer or this or that, then I'll be happy. Then I'll have gladness and joy. If you are in sorrow right now and depressed, feeling bad about yourself and have a bad self-image, prospering and getting a great education that would make you a doctor or a lawyer or whatever you think it is that would make you happy, getting that will only amplify the unhappiness in your life. Yeah. Because education, position, doesn't make you joy-filled or happy. The Lord is our source of joy. Until you make God Almighty your source of joy, you can't bypass God to somehow get to the destination of joy. You can't bypass God to get to happiness. And I think that's the problem. I've got a good friend of mine. That's what he does is he helps do financial planning for doctors. And there are so many people in the medical world who make huge salaries, who are struggling on the verge of bankruptcy or struggling with even paying their bills. Yeah, it's true. And it's because if I could just get this education and get this position, then I'll be somebody, then I'll be happy, only to find out they got to the other side and they were even more unhappy Right. because right. the position only amplified what was already in their heart. Verse 12, oh, Pam, I'm so <laughs> glad you got this verse. <laughs> Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire is fulfilled, it is a tree of life. When we first met each other and got to be friends and stuff, that, that was, was the my first verse my you first ever verse, yeah. spoke from your heart my to me. My little heart felt a little sick because I felt my heart <laughs> hope had been deferred. But isn't it funny how there's two sides of the coin of, yeah, in this verse? Is. And uh-huh. that was the side of the coin that you that were I just, just dwelt on. <laughs> hope deferred makes the heart right. sick. That's why you wrote such great, sad, yeah. <laughs> sad Jesus songs. <laughs> Pam, that's why you wrote, life is hard, but God is good. Right. Precious. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire is fulfilled, what? It's a tree of life. It's a tree of life. And God's desire is to fulfill his will, which is always good, a future and good things going from glory to glory. That is the will of God. God desires to meet our desires. (laughs) (laughs) Look, God doesn't want to kick the can of answer down the street of your life. God doesn't get any pleasure 
pleasure from deferring your hope. Yeah. But God is creating a vessel on the inside of you to be able to hold the goodness. What's the point of having a glass with all kinds of cracks and breaks and holes in it and pouring water into it? You're never going to get it to your mouth before you can get a drink. The water's going to drain out of it. But God heals the vessel. That's God, right. God heals the vessel so that the thing that you hope for, you're able to hold the love. You're able to hold the joy. What's the point in God pouring all kinds of joy in you if your vessel's all broken, if your life is broken and it leaks out the bottom as fast as he pours it in? So what's God do? He heals the vessel. When hope deferred, the heart is being sick, but when the desire is fulfilled, it is a tree of life. What was in the Garden of Eden but the tree of Mm, life? mm -hmm. That was the object that God was getting Adam and Eve to, but they were trying to get to the good stuff by knowledge Mm -hmm. first, not wisdom. wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Right. And being the principal thing, it is the first thing. And wisdom will heal your vessel. Wisdom is all about order first. Pam brought me a cup of tea. Before she brought me the tea, she actually got a cup first. Now, I know that sounds inherently simple, but you know, Pam never just brought a pot of tea and started pouring it in my lap. That was the object. That's what I wanted to get to was the hot good stuff. But if she were to just pour the tea in my lap, all I'd end up getting would be a burn and I'd have no satisfaction from the tea. But she made a vessel first, the vessel, a container with a little handle on it so that it wouldn't even burn my hand. And so I got this precious tea cup. When I said, hey, Pam, bring me some tea. She not only brought me the hot good stuff, she brought a vessel to carry it in. God doesn't want your heart to be sick. He doesn't want hope to be deferred, but you have to have the vessel to hold the good stuff. Your vessel needs to be made sound to hold the life. That's so good. And 13 13 goes right along with this without even a comma almost. Whoever despises the word and counsel of God. And so right away, that's the thing that heals your cup. Yeah. If you despise, yeah. (laughs) Whoever despises the word and counsel of God brings destruction upon himself. Your vessel even further breaks and cracks. Mm -hmm. But he who reverently fears and respects the commandment of God is is rewarded. rewarded. Your cup gets filled. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. 14, the teaching of the wise is the fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. So if you've been getting caught in snares, you know what that means? That's immeasurable in your life. Mm -hmm. That means that you have been either avoiding or you've been neglecting the teaching of the wise Mm -hmm. because that's the fountain of life. You need to have the fountain of life in your world, in your hearing, in your seeing. You can't avoid it. Verse 15, good understanding wins favor. You're going into a situation or you're applying for a job. Ask God for good understanding. Mm -hmm. You want good understanding. When people are talking, you want to have good understanding. When you're with your counselor, when you're with your wise instructor, you want to have good understanding. That in and of itself as a gift from God. Good understanding wins favor. But look at this. The way of the transgressor is hard, like the barren, dry soil or the impassable swamp. Notice how when we're talking about the transgressor, we end up talking about bad ground. Mm -hmm. It's hard ground. It's dry ground. The help of the Holy Spirit is so important because he removes the impassable swamp land in our heart. That's right. He does. Got to get good ground in your heart. And that right there is the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. God's will for us is a highway. It's raised up. It's straight. That should be the way of godly people that walk in the rightness of the Lord and His wisdom and understanding. And you know, I think of this good understanding wins favor. I'm going to read 16, then I'll go back to it. 16, every prudent person deals with knowledge, but a self-confident fool exposes and flaunts his folly. I've heard many situations where, you know, you go overseas and there's certain protocol. There's protocol when you're introduced to the Queen of England, and you need to learn the protocol. When we were going to India to minister, we were told of protocol. There's certain cultural things over there that you should do that give an understanding to build a bridge so they'll understand you and and be open to you. You know, you don't put your hand out here. You wait for them to do that. You don't do this. When you meet with the Queen of England, you curtsy this way. You wait for her to put out her hand. And some people would say, well, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to be myself. And you know, that doesn't win you favor. You need to get understanding in the situation. Ask questions. Being prudent means having Having foresight for the future, an understanding and a knowledge, because if you don't, you'll be a self-confident fool that will expose and flaunt their folly like, oh, that person didn't even ask questions to know what protocol was in that situation. Right. And what we just read in 15, it says, the way of the transgressor is hard. I've heard people even get up in the pulpit and say, you know, being a Christian is not easy. You know, it's a hard life. It's a lot of sacrifice. No, no, no. Hold up a sec. The way of the transgressor, that's a hard life. 
The person who doesn't want to listen to wisdom, that's a hard life. The person who refuses counsel, the person who walks in pride and insolence, that's a hard life. Like Pam was just saying, talking about, you know, a prudent man deals with knowledge, a prudent woman deals with knowledge. You're applying for a job. Get knowledge before you go in. If you're applying for a certain position that requires a certain lifestyle, a certain habit, a certain appearance, you know, you're selling clothes in retail. Don't come walking in looking like a vagabond. Don't come in looking like you never groom. You're never smelling like you're from the gym. People know you're going to be dealing with customers. Nobody wants a smelly salesperson. (laughs) That's right. Sometimes it's just dealing with knowledge that simple, but people are like, oh, I never get a job. Well, you never wash your hair. There's so many ways that we can just line up with making life easy, having prudence, thinking, I'm going to be applying for this position. I need to look like I fit in that position. That's so practical, simple, but true. Right? Verse 17, a wicked messenger falls into evil, but a faithful ambassador brings healing. Wow, that's beautiful. It really is. I can just see the picture of that. A wicked messenger falls into evil. You know, there's a lot of different ways to the understanding of that. But I also think of one aspect of that is to be wise, who's going to be your messenger? If you're in ministry, if you're if you're in a position of authority and you have someone that is speaking for you, be really wise who you allow to represent you or your work. A good name is to be chosen above riches, and the person that you choose to be your messenger, your ambassador, are they a faithful person? Are their lips wise? Mm. Do they have understanding? Do they speak with the right words and the right tone that depicts who you are? Because if not, that can turn around and bite you. A faithful ambassador and messenger brings healing. In other words, can build bridges for you. I've seen a lot of people, even ministry and business, choose the wrong people to be their messenger to be their assistant, to speak for them, it's brought destruction on them. And they're great people, but they've chose the wrong people. Well, think about it. We're called to be ambassadors of Jesus and representing yes. our Father's <laughs> That's Word. That's another and it way says, to look at it, too. when we are faithful representatives of Jesus yeah. and His Word, it says we bring healing. That's right. So we can be carriers of healing. And how do we do that? By representing the Word. Jesus is the Word. So when we walk into that hospital room, when we get on the phone with that person that's going in for an operation, when we're dealing with somebody at church, praying with somebody, I'm not interested in giving somebody the contents of my heart and my own feelings. I may look at them and they may have tubes coming out of them. They may look like death warmed over, but I need to represent, be an ambassador of the Lord Jesus' Word, of His truth. And I can bring healing healing right. because I'm not speaking from what I think. Right. I'm speaking from the mind of Christ. That's good. So right? that's really an ambassador. Verse 18. Poverty and shame come to him who refuses instruction and correction, but he who heeds reproof is honored. You know, I've seen in times in my life where I've tried to always really ask questions and want answers, but there have been times that somebody has given me instruction and correction because I keep hitting my head against the wall in certain things. And there has been times in my life where maybe I just, I didn't want to hear it. It was too hard. Oh dear, I don't think I can ever change there. And continue to hit my head in that particular situation, poverty yeah. kept coming. Yeah. Until I said, you know what, I'm going to embrace correction and instructions and heed it. Then when I heeded that reproof and acted on it, honor immediately came in my life so quickly. But when I refused instruction and reproof, you know, and how many times we even talk to other people and we've given them an answer and they go, oh, that's really good, but they never act on it. You never see any evidence of them acting on it. And you kind of grieve because you keep seeing them walk in poverty or hitting yeah, their head. That's painful. And you say, oh, we love you and I don't want that for you. There's honor right here, but you need to change your way of thinking and doing things. When you look at that, a couple of questions that I think we should all ask ourselves right now. First of all, do you want honor? That's well, good. if you're being honest with yourself, if you really understand what biblical honor is and that God's will is for you to have it, you should say yes. If you want honor, it says here, he who heeds reproof is honored. Then you need to ask yourself this question, and I'm asking myself, who has permission to reprove you in your life? Who has access who is qualified to reprove you according to God's counsel and his wisdom? Not abuse you reprove you, give you answers and make you go forward. The Holy Spirit admonishes us and instructs us. The Holy Spirit uses people, good people, to reprove us and to correct us. Who has permission to reprove you? 
Who can help you get to that honor that God has for you? And that's a really important question to ask because if there's nobody in your life, if there's no voice in your life that's bringing moments of, wow, I'm doing things wrong, or if there's nobody that can reprove you, then you're cut off from honor. That's an important question to ask. Verse 19, satisfied desire is sweet to a person. Therefore, it is hateful and exceedingly offensive to self-confident fools to give up on evil upon which they have set their hearts. So you see that satisfied desire is sweet to a person. So that can be really good if their desire is for goodness and for righteousness. But if their desire is for evil and wickedness, they never get that sweet desire. They never get to that sweet, the satisfied desire, the satisfied desire. So it says here, it's exceedingly hateful and offensive for a self-confident fool to give up on the evil which they've planned in their heart. And that's why, you know, a lot of times in terrorism and things like that, they've so set their heart on their desire to kill people, to destroy life. It's evil for them. Yeah. To give up on the pursuit of it. Right. And they never get the satisfied desire. That old song, I can't get no satisfaction. (laughs) It's like so true. The world, when you've given yourself to anti-God way of doing things and thinking, you're never, ever satisfied of anything. 20. He who walks as a companion. Oh, here we go. He who walks as a companion with wise men is wise. But he who associates with self-confident fools is a fool himself and shall smart for it. Some translations say, he who associates with fools will be destroyed. My friend, every relationship in your life is like a button on an elevator. Every relationship. There is no static buttons that just stay where they are. Every relationship in your life is like a button on an elevator. So if you want to go up, you need to walk with wise people. But if you are set on having relationships with wrong people, they will take you down and you always gravitate toward the lowest denominator in your life. Think about it. Jesus chose 12 disciples and he intentionally chose one, Judas, a betrayer that would help him get to the cross. Wow, that's amazing. Think of it. Even the Pharisees and Sadducees, because Jesus' life was so pure and holy and so full of good works, they couldn't even with their kangaroo court get Jesus to the cross without having an inside betrayer. That's why Jesus himself said, have I not chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? Jesus even had control over that. Jesus chose a devil in his circle of 12 so that I wouldn't have to have a devil in my circle of relationships. Right. Praise God for that. Jesus wore the crown of thorns on his brow so that we could have the crown of righteousness. That's the crown of glory and honor on our brow, supporting our identity in Christ. And that's all according to Psalm 8, verse 5. So Jesus chose one wrong relationship, one devil, to take him down to the cross so that I could be set free from those wrong relationships. So my friend, I'm just encouraging you right now. Choose your destiny by the relationships you allow. Your companions, great companions. Choose your companions according to God's word. He who walks with wise men will be wise. Those who walk with fools, you don't even have to be a fool to get a fool's consequences. You just have to walk with one. Well, Stephen, I've got a circle of 40 amazing, I mean, wise people. In fact, I walk with John Maxwell and I used to walk with Billy Graham and I used to walk with, that's fine, but it's the one fool in your life that will destroy your world. We heard a story the other day from a friend of ours. Now, there was this young woman who used to be a really beautiful person. She was so kind, considerate really long-suffering, patient, tender, talented person. This was what she used to be. And she started to hang out and walk and be companions, close relationship with people that were arrogant, that were scorning, that always found the negative in everybody else. And she probably um, had motives, Pam, where she was thinking, she did have I'm, I'm going to reach gonna out win. To, yeah. I'm going to win these lost people. But she shut, I'm going to influence them. She began walking with them instead and not with the other people who believe like her. And now she is bitter, hard, almost like an evangelist for hate and contention and putting other people down and scorning. All the while, she has a smile on her face um, and acts like she's doing kindness. And you think, how could someone change so dramatically? drastically, it's because she shut out and decided not to walk with the people of like manner who were wise and kind people. But she started walking and having almost 89% of the time companions that were the other way, and she became like them. Friends, if you get a chance, read Haggai, the prophet Haggai, chapter 2. 
It's around verses, I think, 12 and 13, 14. The prophet speaks to the priests and he says, and he gives them a refresher course on holiness. In summary, he asks them a rhetorical question. Is holiness viral? And they're all like, of course it's not. And then he says, is unholiness viral? And they are like, of course it is. And I think we've adapted this mentality sometimes, even within Christian realm, that holiness is viral. That's not biblical. In Corinthians, Paul said, don't you realize that bad company corrupts good morals? Absolutely true. Unholiness is viral. Just like you can catch the flu from somebody, but you cannot catch their workout at the gym, sit in the corner and come out of there a stronger person. That's not how it works. You've got to apply yourself to get the good stuff. That's so good and so easy to understand. When it comes to the bad stuff, you just have to basically be in the room and it's viral, the bug in the room. The next thing you know, you're you're taking your sickness home and passing it around to your family. That's why you build your immune system, build yourself up in the most holy faith, associating with people of like-mindedness. Then when you go out and minister and bring people to Jesus, you're going out of a strong place. You know, we talked to a college student recently that came to you for counsel and said, you know, I have shut out all my other good friends that believe and go to Bible college with me, but I don't really hang out with them very much. There's this one guy for the last three years become my best friend. He's an agnostic, and I hang out with him probably 80, 90% of the time, and still he's never coming to Jesus, and I don't seem to have any influence on him. What's wrong? Right. <laughs> and it was actually, it's like he shut out all his friends that believe like him. He's not affecting this guy. Something's wrong. The guy's affecting him. He's not affecting this guy. You bring up a good point, Pam. It's a serious mistake to think that God sanctions or that somehow it's a righteous act to make a project out of a fool. You don't make a project out of a fool. You present the gospel to everyone. You present the truth. But people make their decisions in that moment. The father in Luke 15 never made a project out of the son, the prodigal son. He let him have his way, and until he came to himself, that's good. The father wasn't investing in him. Uh huh. You have to learn there's good ground to invest in, and there's bad ground. And we pray that a lot of the bad ground over time will get converted, and they will come to himself, right? And they will be ready for the word of God. But you don't make a project of a fool. Here's what Jesus said, and I think it's in John 13. He says, Love one another. By this, the world at large will know who I am by your love for one another. We're to make a project out of one another, a love project out of one another. And the world will see that we're kind and patient and forgiving. I think sometimes it's the opposite. The world will look to us as believers in Jesus and walk and see us fighting, seeing us hating each other, being easily offended. And they think, I would want that for what reason? Right. And when one of us in, we're quick to jump on the other person. Right. I can't believe you did that and you are excommunicated instead of again. When somebody's got a repentant of heart and when they want help, help them, restore them. With love and kindness, yeah. Verse 21, evil pursues sinners. Ooh, that's an ugly picture. But the consistently upright and in right standing with God is recompensed with good. I see this word reward, 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 recompense all through the scriptures when it's just an automatic, almost like a domino effect. When you do things God's way, when you believe on God, trust in God, there's reward, there's good recompense. It's always like sowing and reaping. Verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the upright and the righteous for whom it was laid up. So, you know, this is all about legacy. For me, I believe it's important for us to become legacy minded as young as we can. I mean, if you're 15 years old and you're listening to this, become legacy minded right now. Always be thinking, what am I leaving behind me? Because that really, as Pam was talking about, seed time and harvest, that has to do with what you end up walking into. You know, we're all going to stand before the king of all kings one day, and it's going to be judgment time, which is really about the measurement of how we've stewarded the seed that God has given us. So whether you're 12 or 13 or whether you're 93, be legacy minded, be thinking about what you're leaving behind you. A good man leaves an inheritance, moral stability and goodness to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner, even their wealth is going to end up vacating their life their legacy and finding its way back, it becomes magnetized to the righteous. To the righteous, those in right standing with God, because that's who it's intended for. Yay! Verse 23, much food is in the tilled land of the poor, but there are those who are destroyed 
because of injustice. So injustice is a destroyer. Justice is a rectifier and makes things right. There's much food in the tilled land of the poor. The problem with land is if it's not tilled, you can't get the food out of it. Oh, that's so good. You told me in the Old Testament days, the policy was that businesses and people that own land, they would leave the corners for the poor people to till and to get food from. Let's say you had a square field full of corn. As a believer in God, the welfare plan was to leave the corner so you would harvest in a circle in your square plot of land, and you would leave the corners of that land for the poor, for those who lack. That's how Ruth and Naomi were living off of the corners of Boaz's fields. That's what they were living off of. But it says much food. There's much food. We don't have a food problem in this world. What we have is an inability to exercise righteous application and usage of the land that God has entrusted to us. And so that means there's land that God has given us that we refuse as humanity to take. Yes, that's such a convicting truth. We must not refuse to operate the land or whatever the gift is. There is potential in so many things that God has hidden, reserved, preserved, that we just need to seek Him to appropriate the benefits. 24. He who spares his rod of discipline hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him diligently and punishes him early. Now, I think, again, you have to come back to the tone of God here, what the rod represents. Discipline is not beating somebody. It's not yelling at somebody. It's not causing somebody to get disease. You know, like so many times people will take this and twist it. But you even have told me what the rod represents. You know, it opened the Red Sea. You know, he put his rod out. It parted the Red Sea for protection for all God's people. People to get out of Egypt and go into the promised land. But there is somebody who puts borders and said, this is right, this is wrong, son. This is right, this is wrong, daughter. And you have now gone that way. There are consequences, sweetheart, when you go that way. It's a law of gravity. It's a law of reciprocity. When we read the 23rd Psalm, a famous Psalm, We say, the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He refreshes our soul. It says, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though we walk through really dark, difficult situations, listen to this, we fear no evil. You know why? Because your rod and your staff, they guide and comfort us. Wow, that's so so good. Here's the thing about the rod, biblically, is that it's meant to protect you. It's not meant to destroy you. The rod is meant to be authority in your life, and it authorizes life. It authorizes the better way. Now that's good news. (laughs) You know, if a father were to spare his rod, he's actually sparing his authority. He's keeping his child from access to the inside door. Right. Yes, there is reproof the Bible talks about. When I was a little boy, my mom did not spare the rod when it came to <laughs> applying you know, a little stick to the seat of my pants when I was being naughty. But my mom never abused me. She taught me. She taught me respect in church. Me and my brother would misbehave and create a commotion. My mom would apply the rod to the seat of our pants. What, would she pinch? <laughs> She'd pinch you, right? No, no she, would she, just, wouldn't? she okay. would give us the eye and basically <laughs> let us know when we got home. And you know, our trip home was a good half an hour to 45 minutes. If she said, you're going to get a little, a little spanking, spanking on the bum, trust me, you got a spanking when you got home. But you know, in those moments, we learned that my mom's word was her bond. If she said that we were going to be disciplined, there was punishment. We knew our mom to be very loving and caring and compassionate, but what it did for us was really impressed upon us respect for others, respect for the context of a moment, to know how to listen. We may have been like, oh, but it's boring or it's this or that, but just like parents teach you how to eat healthy food and you develop a taste for it, parents teach you to listen when at first it seems like it requires discipline, but then suddenly it's like, wow, this is really good. Right. And they start feeling better and healthy. I think really, if you just strip it down, it kind of is imparting sowing and reaping. How can you unfold that? Children that get from their parents the sowing and reaping principle of kindness. These are borders. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. This is what mercy is. This is what honor is. This is what loyalty is. Keep your word. These are principles that put up borders Not barriers, but borders of protection. Just like when you walk into a home, there is outside and there's inside. You're safe inside, you're warm, you're cool, you're protected, you have a place to sleep. 
I think sometimes if we refuse to teach to ourselves and our children sowing and reaping, this is what you want to sow, this is what you don't want to sow, because you'll reap this. It's not kind. You know, we're friends with Grant, who is a horse whisperer out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, amazing Diamond Cross ranch out there. And he tells us that horses that have no boundaries or borders of protection, they're just able to do whatever they want to do. They feel fearful and they act the same way as abused horses. They're scared. Proper biblical borders and boundaries, they provide a a context for God's joy and comfort in your life. Verse 25, the uncompromisingly righteous eats to his own satisfaction, but the stomach of the wicked is in want. The uncompromisingly righteous eats to his own satisfaction. That's the will of God for your life, to be able to eat to your own satisfaction, but the stomach of the wicked is is in want. You know, there's a place in God's word where it says that when you live contrary to God's law and God's word, and when you begin to worship other false gods, it says that you will drink, but you won't be filled. Your thirst won't be quenched. You will eat food and you'll be full, but you won't get nutrition. You won't be truly satisfied. This is the world we're living in that's a consumer world. It's all about just getting, 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 but that place in their life, their heart is never filled. People chase after immorality, trying to get a sense of being satisfied. You you said earlier about the Rolling Stone song, I can't get no satisfaction. That's the lifestyle of sin and rebellion. Just can't get enough food to fill that place in your heart. Can't get enough alcohol, enough drugs. You can't get enough immoral living to fill that place in your life. And then suddenly you just end up stepping into destruction that's fatal, that's life-ending. If you go back to where and who our source of righteousness is, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God in Jesus is all about relationships. It's a relationship. We're in Christ Jesus. We're Father God's sons and daughters through Christ Jesus. And I think with that comes an intimacy chemical, even in our mortal bodies, our earth suits. It's an intimacy chemical. When you don't have relationship, we're not in Christ Jesus. We don't allow ourselves to be fathered by Father God in His way of thinking and doing things when we don't submit ourselves to that family. Just like I've read, there is no intimacy chemical in our brain. We have to go to the adrenaline and just get more and more weird behavior because it's just the adrenaline rush. But the adrenaline rush can never substitute for the intimacy chemical that only comes from true relationship. Pam, you know, it says in Hebrews 12, verse 8, that if we are exempt from correction, and without discipline, that we're illegitimate. And I don't want to be illegitimate. I really want to be a son of God. I know you want to be a daughter of God, but that means my life has to have my father's discipline. And God uses his word. We talked about the rod of instruction, of authority, his other sons and daughters for accountability in our life. So Pam, why don't you lead us in prayer? And let's just pray some of this word, Proverbs 13, over our life. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you today. We commit to love your word. We commit to love the way you think and do things. We submit, Father God, through Jesus Christ, we become the rightness of God in Christ Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you're delivering us from destruction because we honor you. We're in awe of you. We hear your word, your way. We quickly do it. Everything we touch succeeds and prospers, moves forward in your will for your glory. I pray for the people, Lord, that their heart feels a little sick. Their mind, will, and emotion is feeling sick because it seems like hope has been deferred. I thank you as we submit ourselves to your wisdom and way of thinking, Lord, that you give us the desires of our heart and we're like a tree of life that other people can come and receive joy and encouragement for. Father, I thank you because we love your understanding that we win favor. We walk in your favor today, Lord. We have foresight for the future. We love having foresight for the future, Lord. And we walk with wise people today and we become wise. Father, I thank you that we will leave, even in our youth, a good inheritance to those around us, yes, to spiritual friends and spiritual children, Lord, that even as a 15-year-old, we could leave a legacy around us of goodness and stability and loyalty and steadfastness in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you that you fill our mouths with good things. Thank and you, Lord, Father. because we water others, Lord, that you allow us to be watered ourselves. For the person right now that feels like they're dry and thirsty, poor Pour your water in and through them and let the river of life come out and through them to their family, to their community, and to others in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. That's so good, Pam. And we love you guys. Yes, we sure do. It's been so great hanging out and reading God's Word today. Pam, I think it's so important for people to remember that no matter what kind of pressure they're going through right now, no matter how they're being squeezed or what's happening, this Word's always true in Philippians 4. It mm-hmm. says, be, be anxious, anxious for, for nothing. nothing, right? Oh, yeah. Don't be worried. Don't be afraid. But by prayer and petitions, yeah. let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. God loves you. He cares about you. And remember this forever. You You are born born to win. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Stephen and Pam Marshall. To receive more information or more teaching, go to www.stephenandpam.com. Stephen and Pam Ministries is a 501c3 charitable organization and your gift helps us to take this message to 1,000 communities worldwide. 